The day Dad and she made the funeral pyre for Patches, they were at the farm in the field with the tractor. They started by gathering the materials around the farm, pallets next to the chicken coop. Dad sawed some logs from the old shacks around. You can find us some kindling for the in-between layers, he said. As she walked away, she waved away the mosquitoes swarming around the pond. With each layer, Dad rotated the pallet 90 degrees. Lane put in the smaller kindling and helped stacked on the logs until she got a splinter. After Dad put the last pallet on, he drilled four holes into the half barrel, put the metal poles through the holes on all four sides, and stuck the other end into the ground with the half barrel on top. This way, the body will stay in place. And slide down as the fire burns, Dad said, pouring in the cement mixture. Lane stood hunched over the little bundle and uncovered the cloth over his whiskers. Watch out, Dad said. After Dad put patches in the half barrel, he laid down the metal plates, the bricks, then told Lane to stand upwind while he sprayed on the diesel fuel and lit the match. They watched it burn. Afterwards, Dad showed her how to build a fire in the back fire pit near the pond using a piece of flint. Dawn was walking in the back field then. There's Dawn on our side of the fence, Dad said. They all waved to the cow, who they called Dawn after Dad. He was sauntering down the line of wispy poplar trees towards the pond to the old abandoned house lost in the cottontails that must have belonged to the old settlement people at Jibo that she and dad had rode dirt bikes to that one time. Back in the farm, the brassy lick from the old mahogany clock kissed her eardrum. It played the tinny melody that chimed three more times. Dong 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 it sounded like dawn everything sounded like him the cow in the field the grandfather clock lane's polka dot socks swinging back and forth they ate barbecue that night and watched the wizard of oz that was one of dad's favorites Dad sat on the piano bench and Jeremiah moved to the couch. Lane flipped through the old photograph album to see Dad as a boy and Grandma and Grandpa young at the racetrack. Above Dad on the wall hung the black and white photograph of one of Grandma and Grandpa's Irish relatives. Dad held up a fork to her, holding a morsel dipped in horseradish. I don't like meat, Lane said, flicking through the album. Just try it, Dad said, reaching out the fork. She plucked it off like a timid bird, but had to admit, dipped in the sauce, it was delicious. Okay, I'm not a vegetarian anymore, she said. Lane knew as soon as she got close enough that the thing hanging was a person. The gunny of his chest, his small stomach, and thin legs. The good shepherd had a tunic like a nightshirt with thin brown shorts underneath that hung tightly to his thighs. There was a sack over his head. She found there was a round dugout going into the tree's base, large enough for her to sit inside. And this is where she retreated, not sure what to do. She stared for a long time. She didn't feel anything. 
In the forest, no trees were alike. They were as unique as people. Some grew into one another. A single trunk could support three different boughs. Sometimes it looked like one tree had its legs wrapped around another tree. Some were just a single standalone tree. And Lane wondered if this was the type of tree she was. As a kid, Lane climbed the tree in her backyard and jumped off the rope, swinging tirelessly. When they still lived in Billings, she'd go to Pioneer Park and have picnics with all of her cousins and grandma and grandpa, mom and dad, her aunts and uncles. In that park, there was a tree that opened like the palm of a hand. It was where dad taught her how to ride her bike. She was out of practice climbing now, and the branches poked into her skin. Yet even so, she felt a higher presence completely enveloping her with unusual grace. Jerry had said that according to Maximus of Tyre, the Celts devoted a cult to Zeus, but the Celtic image of Zeus was a great oak. She did not know if that was true. All she knew was that to get the good shepherd down and give him a proper send-off was all she could do. She had a basic idea of how to do it because a long time ago, Dad and she had built the pyre for patches for her 4-H project. The tree she climbed had accessible low-hung branches that were stripped of leaves and seemed dead unless she looked toward the very top, where green foliage festooned outward. Halfway up, she glanced back at the bowl, still drinking up the sun. She saw the road below, but there was no road ahead. It came to a complete stop. When she got to the branch that held the body, it was a slow process. Her hands calloused. At one point, she had to take a break and lean her back against the tree. But she carried on until the body gave way and she clenched her jaw as she gripped her way back down. Standing back a few seconds before approaching the body, the calmness possessed her with an unusual dexterity as she loosened the rope around the good shepherd's neck and gently raised his head to pull the rope out from underneath and uncover his face. His eyes were closed. His face did not look in anguish. His mouth was open slightly. Lane pulled the good shepherd's body to the white grass field which was smooth like the well-oiled scalp of an old man. She came into a lemon-smelling cypress tree and sat next to a patch of poppies, like red water balloons strewn on the grass. She laid the body next to her as she sat down, wiping the sweat from her brow. Her armpits had sweated through the sheets down to the elbows. She knew a pyre could be built with nearly any type of wood. Julius Caesar's pyre was built from benches from the Senate House. Pompey's was a derelict boat. She left the Good Shepherd and wandered back to the woods to seek out logs of roughly the same size. She came back with her hands full and started to carve out the thick bark. By the time a small pile formed, evening was setting in. She was really in the zone while working, but when she looked up, the work seemed grossly inadequate. It would have to be the kindling for the in-between layer, she decided. She feared the places her mind would go when she stopped working and when night and dreams set in. She rubbed her eyes and gazed into the beige mirage of the lake, where the earth met the water in a vapor. The ships in the distance were like the white flecks in a fingernail. Her fingernails were full of dirt. She could not believe what she saw next.
Thanks for watching my video, guys. I'll be back with another video next Wednesday. Till then, ciao!